from those questions that were submitted so uh, to try to make it as fair as possible and when your name is called um, you get a chance to ask your question. Um, the way it'll start is the first uh, 15 minutes or so the congressman will give a quick update on what's going on with the committees that he serves on and uh, what give kind of a, wa a Washington update. Uh, but before we get started we'd like to do the Pledge of Allegiance. We'll do the flag over here so if you all would mind standing. Pledge of Allegiance to the right of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, here's Congressman Grubman. Well, thanks for being here. The first thing I'd like to do is thank Aaron Sadoff. Is Aaron hanging around here? He was out there directing traffic when I came in here. Uh, is he still out there? He's a good guy. He. Uh, who runs the North Fond du Lac School District here. And many years ago, when I was in the state legislature, I don't even know if they still, they don't do it here anymore. There used to be a meeting in this room every month, just a little bit of political minutia, uh, in which a CESA is a kind of a conglomerate of school districts. And the superintendents from the school districts, all the way from down in Hartford, Wisconsin, to north of Appleton, would meet here once a month and we'd gather in this room and they'd have a chance to ask the state legislators questions. So we, we used to never knew I'd be in this room again. And they didn't used to have this big thing here, so we'd pack the whole room with superintendents. Uh, well, thanks for being here. Uh, I am Glenn Grothman. I'm your congressman. I'm beginning my fourth, uh, fourth year here. I want to tell you a little bit about what's going on. So you know what the job consists of. In an average month, I spend about three weeks in Washington, one week back here. I do come home every weekend. Uh, the reason we're able to do this is this is the week that's back. It looked a little bit earlier this week like I wouldn't be back. It looked like we were going to have a government shutdown. Uh, but we wrapped things up on late on Monday, flew out late Monday night, and we were able to do these. But I was a little bit afraid over the weekend you were just going to get my staff, not just my staff. I would maybe be more informed with my staff. I don't know. But I uh, was glad to be back and glad that I'll be able to be here for everything. Like Al said, and Al, Al does run my uh, fond mic office here, I want to first of all go through the things that have been going on in Washington that you might have read about in the paper, maybe tell you things that you, you don't hear on TV, and then we're going to open things up for questions. When you came in, you'll, you'll have a chance to fill out uh, questionnaires. And Okay, we'll see if we can go I can wrap up all that's going on in Washington and see if I can get rid of everything else. I wanted to get up to a, a little event in Oshkosh later tonight, so I don't want to get out of here too late. Um, first thing that's been going on recently has been the, um, I feel sorry for all our people taking pictures of us because they've heard me speak so many times. So if I got to think of something interesting for them. Um, in any event, uh, we just uh, avoided the government shutdown, but I want to explain to you how that happened, in my opinion, as far as what's going on. So you understand, on a federal level, uh, every year we have a one-year budget that goes from October 1st to September 30th, okay, for a variety of reasons. It seems Congress never passes the budget before October 1st. It hasn't happened since I was there, and quite frankly, right now we still haven't passed that. What, what you guys would refer to as a budget, eventually we'll refer to it as an omnibus bill. But because the uh, government does not we have not appropriated funds through September 30th, what we have to do is we have to pass through what they call continuing resolutions, money to keep the government open. I've always felt that in general, continuing resolutions should be uncontroversial items, because what we're doing is we're saying, pending approval of the final budget, we're just going to fund the government at last year's amount, which to me shouldn't be that, um, that controversial. When Barack Obama was president, I didn't have a problem voting for these. I always consider myself uh, somewhat bipartisan in that, in that regard. And I voted a couple times to keep the government open while the, while the final uh, omnibus bill was pending. However, this time around, not every Democrat, but the vast majority of Democrats decided to not vote for the continuing resolution, which, way, which is why the government sh shut down uh, beginning at 12.01 last uh, Saturday. Uh, they felt they were upset about that we had not come to a resolution on what they call uh, the DACA people. The DACA people are people who were brought here as minors. Uh, their parents came here illegally, and there's some people who feel that because their parents brought them here that they should be 
given some sort of legal status or a pathway to citizenship. I'll talk about the DACA issue in a second, but the first point I'm going to make is I disagree with the people who voted to shut down the government over it. Uh, there are, you know, people sometimes make fun of the government shutdown, but there are a lot of necessary things the government does. Uh, they are issuing permits to allow people to go ahead, uh, go ahead with projects, that sort of thing. They issue your tax refunds. It's nice if the national sites are fully staffed, and it's an inconvenience to people, not to have mentioned it for the government employees when we did shut down the government. I was glad the way President Trump handled things. You know, a few years ago, you would recall there was a government shutdown when President Obama was president. He made a big hoopla about shutting down the national parks or shutting off the monuments. And President Trump didn't do that. He tried to keep things open as far, so far as he did, which I think was a good thing because a lot of people arranged their vacations around these things. And I was glad he made it and as little inconvenience as possible for the average person. Did I notice anything in Washington at the time? Um, if you look in Washington, the congressmen are spread over three buildings, and there are, oh, probably, if I add them up, um, probably nine or ten entrances or exits to those buildings during the one day the government shut down on Monday. They only had one exit open because they didn't have as many security staff, so it took some of the staff two hours to get into the building. Uh, but in, in other regards, I think President Trump handled it for a minimum, minimum of inconvenience for people. Uh, at that time, a compromise was reached, and they funded the government through September 8th. I hope at that time we don't have another government shutdown. Some people are wondering if we're going to have a DACA deal by February 8th. Maybe I'll be surprised, but I don't see how that would happen. Um, because you, in order to get the deal, I think you need a House position and a Senate position and then some sort of compromise. And the way things work in the Senate, because it is an appropriation bill, it would require 60 votes to pass things, which means as a practical matter, you'd probably need Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell to both sign off in the Senate and somehow get 218 people in the House. We have had a working group trying to look at alternatives to DACA, and they have a kind of proposal out there. But we haven't finalized the proposal. We've been told by our leadership team, and I was not a member of the working group, that we will have a, um, a series of meetings next week when we return, in which we all have a chance to weigh in and make changes that we want, make our pitch for new things. Since that hasn't happened yet, I don't even see how the House will be ready to pass a DACA bill, much less have something that's signed off by everybody in the Senate and something that President Trump signs off on. So it'll be interesting to see what happens on February 8th. With regard to DACA, it is apparent that if it's done, um, again, I don't like to use parties because, you know, there are always some people who are Democrats who think more Republican and vice versa. Um, but I think in general there is a concern that if we do something to make the DACA recipients legal, we've got to make sure we won't have this problem again. And something I disagree with both presidents on, and particularly the Bushes, I don't think people have seriously been enforcing our immigration laws in this country for almost 30 years. And it's unfair to people, people come here, but nevertheless, uh, I think our goal should be every immigrant a good immigrant. If we don't adjust the immigration laws to deal with things like chain, um, uh, chain immigration, to deal with um, diversity, um, diversity immigrants, if we don't do something to secure the border in the South, we're going to start down the exact same, we're going to start to the same problems we have right now with the DACA people. You know, we could say we'll make them all legal, and right away more people are going to come here illegally, right away they're going to bring their children with them, you're going to be back to square one. Uh, so I think for most Republicans, they will not vote to give any legal citizenship to the DACA folks unless we get certainty as far as what the immigration laws are in the future. So many people want to come here. Right now we have about 800,000 people here sworn as American citizens, and we are treating children born to people who are even here illegally as American citizens, so we're taking in an awful lot of people right now. We cannot take in everybody who wants to come here. I mean, that should be obvious. We do have something that I think a lot of other people wish they had, and there's no shortage of people who want to come here, but our goal should be every immigrant, a good immigrant. We cannot get, we cannot begin to think that anybody who wants to come here from any country in the world should be able to come here. 
that would fundamentally change America and would lose the great things we have. So it's a very important topic to discuss. I hope we are able to straighten out American immigration laws, but we will see what will happen. Um, the next thing I'd like to talk about a little bit is the tax cut. Since I last did a round of these meetings, we did pass a tax cut. I want to talk, to talk a little bit with you about what happened there and how we arrived at the tax cut. There were actually four versions that I had to be familiar with of changes to the tax law. The first one uh, was changes to the tax law the Republicans were supposed to run on during the 2016 elections. I did not like that bill. I thought that bill was too tilted towards what I'll call the investor class. For example, they wanted to tax interest income at half the rate as working man's income. I mean, to me, what that's sort of like, if I could just sit here and inherit money, I would be paying half the taxes of somebody who was out there working overtime for a living. I thought that was ridiculous, and I didn't like the Republican plan at that time. At every step of the process, I did what, what, did what I could to weigh in more for the working guy. And while investment is important in this country, uh, I kind of waited as not for as big a tax breaks for the investor class. The one type of investors I did try to help were manufacturing. I felt the same way in Washington as I did uh, when I was in Madison, and that is manufacturing is what causes your state or country to be wealthy. Okay, you've got to produce something. <laughs> Wealth is not caused by having a lot of law firms. I used to work for law firms, and that's like a bad thing to do, but just, I'm just saying, you know, insofar as you want to improve the economy, you want to improve the manufacturing economy, the agriculture economy, um, things like the law firms, not as important. So each step of the way, I think we, uh, we moved in the direction that I wanted. By the time we were done, we cut the top corporate rate from 35% to 21%. Even Barack Obama, when he was president, felt we had to cut the top corporate rate for manufacturing because we wanted to be competitive with other countries. We were in a situation which most other industrialized countries had a marginal rate of 20% or less. Um, first of all, and so far as our businesses tried to sell their product, and we're competing against companies based in Europe or Asia, that put us at a competitive disadvantage. Secondly, you have these big multinational corporations who have businesses all over the world as they decide where they're going to open up new businesses or where they're going to close businesses. Um, we, again, do not want to be the short of the stick there. At least with regard to tax law, we want to be able to say, you want to have your business in the United States. The whole purpose of this bill, or the major goal, what we like to put more money in your pockets, was to improve the business climate so that the American economy would grow at a greater rate than we did before. Um, and I, I think that's going to happen. I will tell you this, if that tax bill would have passed, it would have failed the day we would have voted on it, I think we would have seen the stock market fall precipitously. And that would have been a real problem for the American economy. So I think we wound up where we should. An example of something I fought for um, would be the medical deduction. Um, I used to do taxes in my prior life, so I'm very opinionated on it. A lot of Republicans felt we could get rid of the medical deduction because very few people use it. They said, look, if only one or two percent of the public uses the medical deduction, why should we keep it on there? Let's simplify the tax return and take it off. My attitude is, when I think of people who use the medical deduction, I prepare taxes, it was people like in nursing homes, people who didn't have health insurance and maybe had to have a, pay thirty or forty thousand dollars for a surgery, that sort of thing. Maybe people who pay a lot for health insurance and have a big deductible. Uh, right now, it's not unusual for some companies to offer insurance with maybe a ten thousand dollar deductible. Then what happens if somebody has a surgery? Maybe they go into their IRA or four hundred one k to pay for the surgery, so their income goes up. It's good if they can deduct the corresponding medical expense. <coughs> medical expense is to hurt people. <coughs> So by the time I was done and was satisfied with it, I would like to hear from you or your tax preparers on the tax plan. The tax code is incredibly complicated, and this is the biggest change we've had in about 30 years. I will guarantee you there are consequences of this tax bill that we don't anticipate. I think there will be an adjustment to the bill passed sometime in the next six months. That adjustment will have to be bipartisan. It's not going to be a controversial thing. But if you or your tax preparers come across anything that you think, why did it work out on why did it work out this way, let me know and we'll see what we can do. 
about the technical corrections bill that I think is coming up. Um, next thing I'm going to talk about is the budget. I am on the budget committee and there are two parts of the budget. There's what they call the mandatory part of the budget and the discretionary part of the budget. The discretionary part of the budget is the part that we have to vote on and that's the part that we pass continuing resolutions to keep funding. However, most government spending today is in the mandatory part of the budget. I mentioned before that uh, it's more difficult to do things in Congress than you think because it requires 60 votes to do things in the Senate. Under normal circumstances and other elected bodies you deal with, be it the, you know, the North Fond du Lac, I should know where we are a city here in North Fond du Lac, we are a city here, we have, you know, it's a village or a city, we are a city here. Um, on the North Fond du Lac City Council, a majority, if they want to vote for something, they pass it. Fond du Lac County Board, majority passes it. State legislature where I used to work, majority in the Assembly or more, majority in the Senate, you pass it. As a practical matter in the U.S. Senate, it takes uh, 60 votes to pass almost everything instead of 51. Remember, there are 100 senators. That makes things much more difficult. There is one time a year through a process called reconciliation, and they can't use it for everything, but there's one time a year in which you're able to pass things out of the Senate with 51 votes. In this two-year cycle, um, because we didn't use, because of late passage of the 2016, um, the 2016 <coughs> omnibus bill uh, and the fact that we didn't use it in 2016, we had a chance to pass three bills with 51 votes. The first vote, and we have to vote in advance, it says we're going to use it on the first vote, was supposed to be the repeal of Obamacare. I voted for two different repeals of Obamacare. Uh, neither one came to fruition, but that was what we used the 2016 reconciliation for. The next thing was 2017. And we passed the tax cut with 51 votes. That was the second chance to pass a bill with 51 votes. There are rumors right now, by the way, I should introduce Camille. Camille Solberg is here with Senator Johnson's office. Nice to meet you. I am uh, your regional director, so if you have any concerns or questions after he's done, I will be here waiting for them. Thank you. Okay. Um, we anticipated using the 19 or the, I'm sorry, the 2018 reconciliation process for welfare reform. I think welfare reform is even more of an important concern than tax reform because tax reform deals with the economic health of the country and to me, welfare reform deals with kind of the, the moral health of the country. I think right now our welfare system discourages people from working, which is a bad thing. I think our welfare system also, as a practical matter, discourages marriage. And uh, I think, therefore, that should be the most important thing. I know for a while Paul Ryan talked about uh, doing welfare reform in 2017. That wasn't done publicly. Both Donald Trump and Paul Ryan have said they would like to do something with welfare in 2018. Recently, there is a, a rumor going around the U.S. Capitol that the U.S. Senate will not want to use their opportunity to pass something with 51 votes in 2018. If that is true, I think that is legislative malpractice. I mean, as hard as these people work to become U.S. Senators and they have one chance a year to pass something with 51 votes and they're not going to do it, it is almost hard to believe. But I talked to a couple Senators up there and they've almost resolved to the fact that they aren't going to do it. So there's going to have to be an argument up there. I talk about it already on radio, talking about it to you folks. And I hope the budget committee that I am, am on is going to spend a lot of time on TV and radio talking about the fact that if Mitch McConnell is not going to take advantage of his one opportunity to pass something with 51 votes in 2018 and apply pressure to them. When I get back to Washington, uh, we are going to go on a joint retreat with the Senate uh, between the Republican congressmen and the Republican senators, and we will talk to them about this and see what we can do about encouraging to do something here in 2018 on welfare reform. One, just to digress for a second, I think one of the things that causes Washington to not work as well as it should is there's really not as much contact between the senators and representatives that you think. I used to be in the state legislature. I'm sure many of you have been in the state capitol. You see the state assemblymen and state senators walk across the rotunda together. They know each other. They go out to 
compete with each other. In the U.S. Capitol, the uh, U.S. Senators are on the north side of the building, and when they leave the floor of the U.S. Senate at the end of the day, they go further north to their office buildings. The uh, congressmen, the representatives are on the south end of the Capitol. When we're done with the day, we walk back to our offices, which are in buildings further south of the Capitol. It's possible I can be in Washington for a time where we cannot see a U.S. Senator. Obviously, that's not a healthy thing. I wish it was more like Madison, where they talked back and forth all the time. You knew what, what was going on. Uh, but in any event, I think probably the most significant thing that will go on in the next month, though the national news media is going to be talking about DACA, and when we get the last budget on time, I think the most significant thing in the next couple months is whether the Senate is going to decide to do something with 51 votes give a shot at welfare reform, or they won't. Like I said, welfare reform is important for these reasons. I can think of three type of things that they might put on in welfare reform. Uh, one of the things is, I think there might be some work requirements. They have tried work requirements in Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, we only did work requirements for food stamps, for uh, single people without dependents. It was amazing the number of people who decided if they had to work, they didn't really need food stamps anymore. I think you're going to find the same things with things like low-income housing. I think you're going to find the same thing with TANF payments. So I think work requirements are a good thing. The next thing I'd like to see is time limits. We have to help people who are down on their luck. But I don't think these welfare programs were things designed to, to be a permanent lifestyle. You know, they were designed for six months, maybe a year. They sure weren't things you expect to use for 15 years. So I'd like to put time limits on things. And the final thing people talk about is some sort of drug testing. There are many factories out there who are looking for people to work right now, and they tell me they in part can't find people because they can't find people to pass the drug test. Well, to me, if you're applying for a job and can't get a job because you can't pass the drug test, well, then you shouldn't be able to get a check for welfare-related things either. So um, these are the type of things I'd like to see in some sort of bill. We'll see whether I get my way and the Senate agrees to work on something in 2018 or not, but uh, that's the next big thing that's going on. I'll talk in general with regard to the budget they're working on here and my fear that there will be a great increase in spending. Through a process called sequester for about six years in a row, there was actually a reduction in what we call discretionary spending, both defense and non-defense. Hardly there was a cut, but there really was in Washington. However, if you know children or grandchildren in the military, uh, they'll tell you that right now there are planes that can't fly, there are tanks that aren't starting in Europe because they don't have enough spare parts, they don't they have enough money. Now the military is wasting money, but nevertheless, I, I don't think anybody I talk to over there doesn't feel they need an increase in spending, not to mention it would be time to give some of these guys raises that they haven't had in quite a while. Um, so Donald Trump proposed a 5.5% increase in defense spending. There were, I think, at least 40, probably at least 40 Republican congressmen who felt the 5.5% increase wasn't enough. A lot of them wanted to go for over a 10% increase. I think 10% increase is a lot in any one year for anybody. And if you get that big of an increase, you don't even know what to do with it. Um, I was not in favor of that, but we reached a compromise where the Republican position will be around an 8, 8.5%, 9% increase in military spending this year. I think the fear is once they get done negotiating, and again, this is one of those things that takes both the Democrats and Republicans to vote for it out of the Senate. I'm afraid Chuck Schumer from New York is going to say, uh, I'll give you your 8.5% increase in military spending, but I want a substantial increase in non-military spending as well. You could end up with a situation which overall government spending was up for 7 or 8%. <coughs> We're already in a situation in which the average American is $60,000 in debt. Um, that's obviously unacceptable, and we shouldn't be have overall government spending going up, you know, 7 or 8% next year. But that is the situation that it looks like in the budget. By the time we get done passing this reconciliation bill, I think it's already going to be March, which by itself is a little bit scandalous because you've got a 12-month year and you're not really passing the finalized document to fund the government until over five months into the 12-month year. But that's a little bit what's going on with regard to the budget. 
Um, other committees I'm on, I'm on the Government Oversight Committee. That committee takes up a variety of government scandals, or traditionally has. Um, we switched committee chairman on that committee. For those of you who watched C-SPAN, the chairman I had at the beginning of last year was a guy by the name of Jason Chaffetz, who made it one of the most hardworking committees up there and kept me always busy, frequently having one more than one, more than one committee a day. Jason decided to quit to make some more money and be home every night. Um, and I wish him well, but as the result, we switched committee chairman and took the new committee chairman, a guy by the name of Trey Gowdy, a while to get going. Um, some of us want to be more aggressive pursuing scandals because you know there's no shortage of scandals to look at in Washington. And hopefully that committee, what we do hold hearings, is going to be more aggressive at looking at some of these things in the future. The other committee that I'm on is the Education and Workforce Committee. Is Aaron, by the way, Aaron see if ever be appear around here? Or? Right back here, Representative. There he is. Now that he's back, we might, let's give him some applause. For all the time. <laughs> He said what a wonderful job you oh, did. We right. talked about the room, the historical significance of this room. Unbelievable stuff went in here back when you were serving down in the West Bend area. That's exactly right. And now you have this big fancy thing here instead. Well, that's uh, STEM. That's our ro that's robotics. So that's our, we have six different teams and they compete all over the state. Actually, we've made it to nationals already. So it's, uh, so they'll be all taking over this room tonight and making like big erector set robots. So it's welcome, fine. everybody. You should bring, make sure all your children and grandchildren wind up going to school in the North Final Act School District before they're missing something. Um, okay, in any event, with regard to the Education Committee, I also have a new committee chairman there. The new committee chairman is a woman by the name of Virginia Fox from North Carolina. She was an administrator for Appalachian State University in North Carolina. Not surprising that well, that committee covers a variety of things. Her focus is primarily on college education. Um, we are passing a higher education bill out of committee that I voted for. There are two major areas that I would like to see progress made. I think we're making a little bit of progress in both areas in that committee. One of those things is I don't want in the future kids to have these huge student loans. It's not impossible to find young couples, even in their early 30s, with $100,000 of student loan debt. Uh, and they're in a position in which it's very difficult to buy a house, very difficult to have children. Um, there are a variety of things we can do that I'm in favor of. When we talk to some of the uh, people who run the universities, they feel that some kids are taking out loans, and I'll believe this because it was true when I went to college in the 70s, they take out loans a little bigger than necessary because sometimes those loans go for beyond paying for tuition and books. Maybe they pay for a little bit of a lifestyle thing as well. Uh, some of the college administrators say we'd like to have a little more counseling with those kids first and maybe they wouldn't take out student loans that were quite as big. The other thing we want to do is we want to put a little bit of pressure on the universities to make sure they don't they don't give out loans to kids who won't be able to repay them. So we're going to look at if individual institutions have a repayment rate that's not high enough, we're going to sanction them in some way. Um, hopefully that will cause these institutions to make sure kids going through them are more likely to get a job. Maybe they'll set them up with internships. Maybe they will steer them more into majors that will lead to jobs. And maybe they'll pay a little bit more attention to who they're letting into the universities in the first place. Because maybe there's some universities out there who feel that, well, if somebody only hangs around here for one or two years before they drop out, well, at least we've got tuition for one or two years. Uh, that obviously doesn't do anybody any good. So we're going to try to sanction them. The other thing is we do want to have more kids aimed at what I'll call skills-based education. Um, right now, there are a lot of people, maybe they get a general degree from a university, they don't get a good job, maybe they want to be even going back to tech school, going back to trade school when they're 26 or 27 years old. Obviously, that was a big mistake in their life because they're late getting a start on the career that's going to carry them for the rest of their life. It's also a problem because you know, they already have wasted the time and the student did otherwise. You go to a trade school, um, if, you're st if you steer you in that direction, uh, you can get a certificate, be making more money than most college graduates, and even be making money uh, as you go through an apprenticeship. Um, I think frequently you get college degrees if you go to a tech school where one more time, even though a tech school costs you money, you're getting out quicker than you would if you go to a four-year college. And again, if you have a skill, you're making more money than many college graduates. So we have to find a way to steer more people that way. That is also very important for the future of the economy. 
And when I talk to manufacturers around here, when you talk to the trades, one of their biggest problems is, where are we going to find people to do the work? And a lot of people doing the work right now are in their 50s or 60s. They really worry where they're going to find people to do work 10 years, 15 years down the road. So we have to highlight the ability to get some skills that will carry you so we have more kids going to that sort of thing. By the way, when I talk about manufacturing, and I did not know this until, I don't know, when I first heard it 10 years ago or something, in the country, Wisconsin has the second, high, second highest percentage of people in manufacturing in the country. Did you know that? No. no. They always talk about, you know, America's dairy land. Number one is Indiana. Wisconsin's right under them, and then there's a drop before you get to Michigan. In this area that I represent, which goes up and down Lake Michigan from like two rivers down to Port Washington and across the middle of the state all the way over to Wisconsin Dells, um, there are more jobs, manufacturing jobs, than in any of the other 434 um, congressional districts. Isn't that something? You said, what congressman has the most manufacturing jobs in their district? You probably think, well, maybe somebody from Houston, maybe Chicago, maybe Pittsburgh. It's right here. You know, Oshkosh, Fond du Lac, Sheboygan, you ice. You have all these factories around here in the industrial parks, and you just kind of think that's the norm. But we've got more of them around here than anywhere else in the country. But that's what's going on on the Education Committee. I'm trying what else I can tell you about. We're going to be working on, and we believe we're going to get somebody to come through here, uh, somebody of note, dealing with the war on drugs, particularly opiates and heroin. Um, it's been a publicized problem, but as publicized as it is, it's still under-publicized. So we want to hear what they're doing on a national level, as, whether, as well as them giving them some advice from people dealing with that problem around here. We hope sometime in the next couple of months we have somebody coming through. I don't know if it'll be an Oshkosh or Fond du Lac or Sheboygan, but we are working on something on. In that regard, people sometimes ask me about Donald Trump and what he's like. Um, I think he overall is doing a, you know, a good job. I like his cabinet appointees. I think his appointees are doing a good job, and it's one of the reasons why the economy is proving a lot. I, I like his judicial picks. When I did get a chance to talk to him, I talked about his tweeting. I think uh, a little more than that than we need. Uh, I don't get a chance to talk to him a lot. I've had maybe one two-minute conversation with him in the last year, but I used that two minutes to discuss that with him. I think. Uh, I think he would be more popular and more effective and look more professional if he didn't tweet as much as he does, if he were kind of restricted to a few public policy related items. I think it would help him and help all of us. I did not succeed. <laughs> but we'll try again. It's hard to talk to him. You know, you're one of 435 congressmen. And I wish I could just give him a call and say, tell us, scheduler, set aside 20 minutes for Glenn Grothman, would you? But I tried, it doesn't work, <laughs> but I'm sure I'll catch up to him again. I run into him and I'm able to shake his hand a lot, but really have a conversation, only one conversation in his first year in office. So, that's a, that's a part of it. <laughs> see if he responds to me, see if I got a national television. President Trump responded to Congressman Growth the other day. Um, okay, well now I'll open it up for questions, see what else is on your mind. Uh, Rachel over here. Uh, has arrived. She runs, uh, she's my chief of staff, so she's normally based in Washington, but she's out of Fall River, and we're glad to have her back in Wisconsin today, and she's going to read us some questions. Mark Lors? Mark? Mark from Fond du Lac? You can ask your question. Oh, um, regarding the last um, the shutdown, I I, I have to say I was disappointed in reading the, I felt a very partisan rhetoric that you said you called it the Schumer shutdown and then you said you wrote some kind of letter that the military got paid and I, I thought, of course they're getting paid. I, I'm a government employee and I'm obviously getting paid. It was just another, it was actually a pay day off for me and I, I just, I'm disappointed that this even happened. It's so inefficient and, and um, as a matter of fact, in 2013 it was Republicans that did this. So. I, you can't blame the Democrats. Well, um, I, I think I made it clear not all Democrats voted for the shutdown. But I voted against the shutdown. I voted to keep funding the government. I don't think it should be a partisan matter. I twice voted for continuing resolutions when Barack Obama was president. And 
I try not to make these things partisan. I'm also honest with people, though. If you look to avoid it, no, in both the House and the Senate. It wasn't every Democrat, but it was overwhelmingly Democrats. And hopefully we can keep things going and, and not disrupt things. Can I ask you what department you work for? Um, I work for the IRS. Okay. And I read stuff about that. that I'm sure nobody likes us. We don't get any money from Congress. But um, we, government doesn't run without uh, taxes. And right. Well, I used to deal with the IRS employees, like I said, in my old day. I know what you do, and tax are much more interesting than the average person thinks. Is that true? Yes, and they're very complicated. And, right. Uh, there's exceptions to so. You can let me know in particular when you look at the tax bill whether any changes we've got to make because you don't know, because there are always inadvertent problems with every major tax bill that passed. And I remember when I was doing tax, we had to familiarize myself with, I think it was in the 82 or 83 tax cut that Reagan passed, and there was another big one in 86. And it, Took a long time to familiarize yourself with all the, those changes, and these are probably going to be bigger than changes the last time around. So you can give me input when you have time to be educated on all the changes. Robin Woods or Jim We're together. Oh, okay. Um, <coughs> do you want to ask the Social Security question? Uh, you know the tax cut that was just cut. I know that they said they have a question is there, that. Funding has to be cut to match the amount of money that's going to come down from the taxes, and that happens. Social Security is a big part of the tax or the, of the budget. I'm concerned that it's not going to be enough to uh, make it work in the future, and that that's going to be cut. Because I know Paul Ryan has talked about changing Social Security in a lot of ways, and I'm on Social Security right now. And I know there's a lot of other people who are going to be coming for it, and I just I'm concerned about that in the future. Will there be enough for them to have it? Or are they going to be facing major cuts in their in their benefits? No, they're not going to be major cuts. And you've got to remember, the goal of the tax cuts was to get more revenue in in the long run. Okay, the economy was growing at about a two percent annual rate. We would love to have the economy growing at a three or four or five percent rate. I'm sure, even even in anticipation of the tax cut, I'm sure the stocks went up. People who sell stocks, there are going to be more capital gains. I would be surprised if when they give us the final numbers on the amount of money that comes in by April 15th, it's already higher than was originally anticipated. And I will be disappointed if the tax cuts don't result in the economy growing at a 1, 1.5% or 2% greater clip than it was growing before. And if that happens for the next seven or eight years, um, I think we can be ahead of the game. The, so, the primary purpose of the tax cuts, like I said, was well, nice to give people more money in their pocket, is to grow the economy. I'm sorry I cut you off. No, no, no problem. I just, I just wonder then, so you personally feel that you would not support any cuts to, to benefits in Social Security? Um, I don't think it's going to happen for a few years yet because Donald Trump made it clear he's not going to support something like well, that. Do you, how do you feel about that? Um, I think I'm not thrilled with it, but a lot of people out there feel that for the very wealthy, they may begin to pay back benefits. The idea being if you're somebody who's making $500,000 a year, you don't need Social Security. And I'm not thrilled with it because it penalizes people who keep working sometimes and that sort of thing. But the day may come, not in the next few years, but the day may come someday when they look at people who are very wealthy or getting a lot of income and they take a little bit of their Social Security. A lot of people talk about that, but it's not going to happen in the near future. And our goal is to get in more receipts on Social Security as more people go to work and presumably they get raises. Dennis, welcome. Hi. Um, I get the impression that our elected officials on both sides of the aisle get an awful lot of pressure from our non-elected people running the Democratic machine and the Republican machine. And uh, whereby, if you don't vote this way, the party line, you're not going to get any money at the next election, this sort of thing. Personally, it has affected my, my decision to support the Republican Party. Uh, I don't see a difference between the two parties when it comes to the mechanisms that are telling you how to vote. I'm voting for you. I support you. Right. I'm not voting for those clowns behind the curtain who are telling you what to do. Right. 
and it's, it, it impacts my uh, decision to, to uh, donate to the party. Well, <laughs> um, I, you know, even in the little talk I had here, uh, and I can be a little more aggressive behind closed doors, I think I explained to you that I did not agree with the original Republican plan that we were supposed to run on a year and a half ago. I don't think many people will say that. Um, I think I explained that I disagreed with the original Republican plan to get rid of the uh, medical deduction. I talked that I feel that what we need an increase in military spending. It doesn't have to be as high as the increase that the Republican leadership wants. So I'm not afraid to disagree with my leadership. Um, and I hope if I needed Paul help me out in the next election, I don't know, but he doesn't threaten me. You know, he cajoles me sometimes to vote the way Paul wants, but he's never threatened me. Uh, I should proceed what you said. I wanted to thank you, before I, I forgot to do this, I wanted to thank you for your willingness to work in the swamp in D.C. Okay. <laughs> it is a swamp. They're not doing a very good job. And I, I can't deny that. I mean, you got the huge debt. And, there is a lack of sense of urgency in Washington as well, but um, I will also say with regard to partisanship, there are good and bad things that come out of it, but this 60 rule in the Senate means almost every major piece of legislation is bipartisan. I mean, the three years since I've been there, they had a major piece of education reform in K-12 education. They had probably the most significant transportation bill in the last seven or eight years. They had a huge Medicare bill, changing reimbursement, and that. All of those bills were passed on a bipartisan basis. I will be surprised in the next year if they don't do an infrastructure bill that is very bipartisan. Um, and every omnibus bill, which is the equivalent of our budget, because it does take 60 votes in the Senate, is bipartisan. As a matter of fact, the only, there were some regulations we were able to undo Donald Trump first took office that were not partisan, but the only significant, really partisan thing we've done in my three years there is the tax cut. We tried to do something partisan on Obamacare and failed, um, and if we do something on the welfare, that might be partisan, but the vast majority of things we do, they're things that, uh, you know, Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan all, all sign off on. Uh, on a personal level, I always kind of grimace a little bit when I see one of my colleagues get up on the floor of the, of the house and rail away and, uh, 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 because I know they're going to put that on the news that night. And at least on a personal level, we get along well. And then we'll go back and people ask, when I get back there on Monday, the Democrats will ask, you know, what did you do over the weekend or did you watch the football game or how was the weather back home or that sort of thing. And then on a personal level, I think we get along well. It's just that there are fundamental differences between the parties. As far as the overall size of government, the amount of regulation of government, maybe the amount of welfare that's necessary, and on that sort of thing, you're going to have disagreements. Thank you. Well, it's actually funny. My question, you've actually directly addressed it. Because um, my big question concern is this partisanship, this feeling that coming out of Washington, it's everything's either red, blue, left, right. And just my big frustration comes that so many people I hear around here sound very middle, very middle of the road, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, that yeah, idea of working together. I'll emphasize again, the rules of the Senate, which I'm sometimes not thrilled with, but the rules of the Senate mean that every bill but one every year, by definition, is bipartisan. I, and I wonder why the press doesn't talk about that. I guess the reason is the press feels to be on the news at night. We've got to talk about um, people arguing over something. So when we pass a significant bill changing Medicare and the way we reimburse things, uh, that gets no press. Maybe in part because it's boring, but in part because leadership on both sides agreed to it. So they didn't give up and give long-winded speeches why the other side is bad and it's not on, on the news at night. But remember, all but one bill a year, including the big annual appropriation bill that funds the government, under current practice has got to be bipartisan. And the sides eventually meet 
and usually a majority of Republicans and a more majority of Democrats vote for that bill. I voted for them and against them, depending upon the bill. to what extent the Republican Party really supports President Trump, aside from this tweeting thing, which you said, you know what I mean, that was something, an issue you took up with him, but I mean, aside from that, how do you feel he's really doing yesterday? He's but, <coughs> the behind um, I think more are not than you would think. Uh, I am behind him as he tries to deal with immigration all the way. Uh, I'm behind him on the tax cuts. He proposed a budget that had, I won't say substantial, it was like an 8 or 9% cut in discretionary spending. I wish it would have been a lot closer to what he did. Well, I disagree with individual lines on that budget. I sided with Trump against the majority of the Republicans there. I think Donald Trump wants to get stuff done. And I think in a lot of ways our country's in a lot of trouble compared to where our country was 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, Donald Trump has a sense of urgency that too many Republicans do not have. And that is one of the biggest disappointments I have right now with, I guess, other Republicans. I mean, when, when the election results came in, um, a year ago, past November, I thought there were going to be big changes in Washington. And they're changes, but they're not big changes. And I think Donald Trump wants big changes, and he's getting little changes or incremental changes because I think a lot of Republicans don't want the big changes that people like me want. And uh, I'm not sure why that is. I guess I'll say, I always say, there's a lack of sense of urgency in Washington. To me, on uh, things like the increase in the debt, on things like the increasing dependence on welfare, on things like are we going to pick our immigrants or it's ever sneaks in the country, it's now or never, baby. And uh, I think Trump does feel it's now or never. And for a lot of the congressmen, it's just another year. You know, it's like we're sitting here and it's 1973 and we have 40 years to right the ship. I don't think we have a lot of time to write the ship, and that's what I like about Trump. I think he knows we've got to write the ship now, too. Thank you. Gene Green. Joe Gerard. Uh, my question is, are you, Donald Trump, and all the Republicans, are they going to stand firm on the secretary? Or I will make the point that if they cave, if Democrats 90 percent of what they want, or only 10 or 20 percent of what Republicans say they want, there's going to be a lot. I know so many people have said, I will sit home at the time. Why should I vote for an opposition party that shows no opposition? And so are you going to stand for any chain migration, go to a merit-based system, having this silly lottery? Because I grew up in a town just south of here called Waukegan, Illinois. The joke is it's now called Waukegan. In the 90s, they got overrun with illegal immigration. They bankrupted everything. Property taxes tripled to fund the schools because I saw it in my own neighborhood. I owned the house, and within five years, this house, this house, this house, this house, this house, this house two, three, even four families living in one house, sending all their kids to school, and the schools were funded by property taxes, and only one out of those three or four families are paying property taxes. My taxes went from 2200 to 2500 in five years. Four years later, they were six grand. And that's the negative side of just letting people pour into this country unchecked and unregulated. And I'm sorry, you know, if you guys think you're going to get voted back by going along to get along. The Democrats, you know, the Democrats are going to, in time, are going to clean clean the floor. And I understand why they love this 
immigration from all these poor countries with no skill and stuff, because at some point they're going to find, go to get a service, and they got their books. And if you want to have a, a country that looks like my hometown, and I believe I saw Delavan just over by Lake Geneva going the same way. I mean, if that's what people want to live like, we need to control. How can Okay, just talk about jobs. How can you pour three or four million people in this country year after year after year after year? There's got to be some kind of control on this. Um, as I mentioned before, immigration is something that we have to solve. What this country looks like 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years ago uh, depends upon the immigrants we're letting in the country. I was very critical of both Bushes for apparently feeling that the way you solve the labor shortage in the United States is let anybody come in here. I'm exaggerating a little bit by saying anybody, but by not taking enforcement of the immigration law serious and saying we're okay if, I don't know the exact numbers, 70% of the immigrants are good and 30% are bad. Because if those are the numbers, America's destroyed. You know, we got to aim for every immigrant being a good immigrant. I think there are some Republicans, um, either, either because they're listening to the big business interests who want the cheap labor, or because they don't want to be accused of being mean, or because they're afraid of explaining the shutdown, who want to cave in. Uh, on the little three-day shutdown, they didn't cave in. I was glad they didn't cave in for three days. But you're right, it's possible next time it may take a lot more than three days. I think the public is on our side. You don't like to have fights in Congress. It's not like all the Republicans think one way and all the Democrats think the other way. But if we came in on the immigration issue, the country is lost. And I know full well the country is lost. And um, any country's got to protect its borders. Um, there are some high-profile Republicans who I don't want to think they want to, don't want to take the immigration situation seriously. You know, Bush, uh, that crowd, uh, you see Lindsey Graham on TV. And um, I do all I can to persuade my colleagues that we cannot be blackmailed on this issue. Well, I don't like to shut down the government. Under the current rules, <coughs> the party has the ability to shut down the government. And if Democrats like Chuck Schumer, I'm not going to say all Democrats, if they want to shut down the government, well, then we've just got to be prepared to wait them out. Because you're right on things like chain migration, on things like security of the border. If we don't get our way, we're done. No, I agree with I you. I understand you're saying it has to be bipartisan. The more I watch the Democrats over there, they're going so far to the other end. I just don't see much I, partisanship <coughs> ever occurring. Right. I, I am. I talk about the 60 rule in the Senate and the frustration in not getting things done. And there are some things we can get done because we can, you know, once a year do the tax reform, do the welfare reform. On immigration law, under the current rules of the Senate, they can't make the changes they should make with, uh, with 51 votes. But we've got to make those changes and find a way to get it done. Or like I said, the country's sunk. We, it's got to be every immigrant is a good immigrant. I agree with you on and it's now or never. And once we lose the country, we're not getting it back. Right. You're exactly right. There is a tipping point. It's not like you're going to be able to get another election to turn it around once it's lost. Dave Conan. I'd like to yield my question time to somebody else. Mary Smith. Back to immigration. I have some concerns about all the sanctuary cities. Yep. That's ridiculous. And one other comment I've been doing. The cost that it cost in this country to become a citizen is astronomical. I know I have somebody in my family that became a citizen a few years ago. The money they had to dish out was thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Maybe that ought to be leveled off just a little bit easier, not quite so costly, to become a citizen. We got lots of people out there that are uh, American residents, I think they're called, the level before you become a citizen. They can't afford to become a citizen. It's so costly. Um, with regard to sanctuary cities, 
When you talk about partisanship, I don't think you would have had sanctuary cities 30 years ago. I mean, everybody understood their immigration laws, you obey the laws, and if you don't obey the laws, that's trouble. We now have not just some screwball, but elected officials. Well, a lot of times elected officials and screwballs maybe it's the same thing. Um, but in essence, putting a sign up on their city or county or entire state saying, we don't enforce immigration as long as laws here, or in other words, I'm going to enable illegal immigration. And you know, so many people talk about partisanship. <coughs> to me, that's something that that you would never would have seen 30 years ago. And a lot of people right now seem to think the United States continue to exist as we know it if we don't enforce the immigration laws. Well, it's not going to exist. It's going to be all over and your kids and grandchildren are not going to have the wonderful country that we live in. I'm very aware of what's at stake and part of the deal that we want to cut if there is a deal is to get rid of these sanctuary cities. We've got to come down on them hard and you're absolutely right. It's very expensive I think in the end to run the sanctuary cities because you're going to wind up having more illegal immigrants taking advantage of the health care, taking advantage of the education system and the federal government ought not be pumping money into municipalities to go down that road. Right there on their own right. Why is it so expensive? Why is it so expensive? Can you address the cost that it feel? I honestly don't know the exact amount. Uh, we have an immigration specialist in our office, and I will talk to her about it when I get back. It costs thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Yep. And, and the problem with that process is they send you all the their immigration team will send you all these questionnaires and forms, et cetera, et cetera, and you have to dish out some money to go further to the next step. The problem is the next step is identical to the first step, just with a few more things added to it, and now it's some more money. And, and it's, it's thousands and thousands of dollars. I think my family spent like eight to ten thousand dollars. Yep. So we need to make it simpler to become a citizen. If we can't help people become citizens and dish all this money out to the illegals, that doesn't make sense. No. Doesn't right. Make sense. <laughs> we'll look into it. Next one is Thomas Neenfeld. And I know uh, Zach said he's been working with you, but um, and he's happy to meet with you again afterwards. So. Thomas Neenfeld? Yeah. Oh, there you go. I have a different question that I put down on there. Oh. Okay. One question is I'm a vet, a Vietnam vet, and I'm going after compensation right now for Agent Orange. Mm -hmm. I'm in three years so far, and they say it's going to take maybe four or five years before they make a resolution. Why can't they just hire more people if there are so many people on this list? Well, we're working on our budget right now. Um, like I said, there's going to be an increase in spending. Uh, usually, the Republicans try to put more money in the VA. There's going to be an increase in spending, and I'll make sure I share your concern with the people working on that issue so you understand how they put together the budget. <coughs> Paul Ryan is relatively hands off on the budget to a surprising degree. He prides himself on delegating that to something called the Appropriations Committee. I'll look at the person in charge of Veterans Affairs and see if they can put more money in there. Traditionally, if there are going to be increases in spending, the Republicans push for more money for things like the VA, and I'll see what I can do. Gary Melker? Yes, good afternoon. Getting older too. <laughs> 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 and this immigration thing, I feel the same way, and possibly if they can't restrict it somehow, I think they should restrict some of these new immigrants that came here illegally that they can't vote. Unless you were born here or whatever, they can't vote. They can't vote. Well, California proposes if you have a driver's license, yeah. then you're yeah. able to vote. Yeah. If you have a driver's license, you can vote. Right. They, they should not be able to vote. You know, people always claim that some of them are voting. What's going to happen? They're going to take over the Democrats. And have, you know, it's all going to be Democrats. And if you, if you, it's still way tougher. What's um, basically going on? Trump's a fly in the ointment. There's a movement by the establishment to lead us into the one world system, eliminate our borders, and get rid of the Constitution. That's what he's against. He wants to retain our borders. It is amazing to me the number of Republicans who do not really seem 
see an urgency in enforcing the immigration laws. And the Bushes were in there for 12 years between them. And when they I didn't heard, really seem like they cared about it. When I heard George Bush say he was voting for Hillary Clinton last year, it blew my mind. That dedicated Republican? Most people don't even know that, I don't think. He said he was voting for Hillary. That's right. They're part of the establishment. So is Ryan, Paul Ryan. That's why he's not doing that on a lot. He doesn't dare to do that. He's well, on a mission. Paul's a nice guy, a very good guy who, who helps me out a lot. I, I will say that the Bush Republicans, um, for a long time, enforced our immigration laws half-heartedly. Mm -hmm. And you have to ask yourself why they did that. And I will tell you behind the scenes, there are Republicans right now who, going to your concern, um, would, I think their position on, on these um, on these immigration laws and on the DACA is very similar to what a lot of Democrats are. And you, 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 I'll, I'll agree with you on this. Well, if we don't get this one right, we can lose the country. You're right. Right. And we're not getting it back. Another tax payment to Washington quarterly. I say I don't feel like doing this. What am I doing? I'm mm -hmm. supporting all these illegals all the time. They're getting all the welfare, etc. The last there. thing I got, and then I'll sit down, <laughs> is what are we doing to strengthen the grid against the EMP? Doesn't seem to be much going on. Um, they they passed things a couple of years ago, but it is something I think they should be more aggressive on. We are. Um, spending more money in this defense budget on anti-missile defenses and we should spend a lot more there. I was in Israel earlier this year and it's amazing the technology they have but we've got to make the use of it uh, so if something would happen we're ready for it. Thank you. Nick, test Yep. Um, so I just seen today there's a new story out that uh, President Trump's new immigration proposal um, is going to include a path of, to citizenship for an estimated 1.8 young undocumented immigrants. Um, looks like in exchange for $25 billion for his border wall. I'm just wondering if you would support a plan for that. Um, I'd have to look at it. I cannot imagine. I mean, all of the things that I have looked at include 10 or 12 different provisions, and I'd have to see what they're doing on the other provisions. And we all know in the past that things come out, they say the White House is taking such and such a position, and five hours later they aren't taking that position, so. Would you support a path to citizenship for dreamers? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think people who are illegally should get a path to citizenship. I think, I think we're going to have to do something with them. President Trump has made it clear that we're going to have to do something. And uh, there's certainly many other people in this country illegally on visas that are not citizens. So you think we should deport 700, 800,000 people? Uh, no, I think the current system of looking to deport people who have a reason to be deported is more appropriate. Robert Pauley? I'm a under 30 year old uh, single student with student loans. How are the taxes going to, how are, how will the healthcare system work for someone under 30 who's still paying off the student loans? Well, I think it depends for the, the person on a case by case basis. Okay. Uh, with the, then with the student loan debt, I know you just talked about that, but. I've got $26,000 worth of loans to pay off yet, and I graduated just a couple years ago in 2015. Can I ask you, do you, have a, do you feel you have a good job? I do work at Culver's in Plymouth, and I'm making, this year I made about $23,500 before, before taxes. Okay, what was your degree in? History and Theology. And from what college? So we're like in Manitowoc. Okay, thanks for your story. Thank you. Michael Ketterby. Yeah. Marsha Hosh. Yes, Marsha. Um, in the past few days, there's been a lot of talk on the news about a four-page memo 
regarding, I believe, the FBI and the DOJ? Right. Um, I would like to see that memo released. Have you um, read the memo? Yeah, I've read it. When we read it, we're, we've got to send a document saying right. we won't tell people what's in it. But <laughs> I think you should be able to see what's in it. When I look at the memo, normally when something to me is kept confidential, it's because you're protecting, uh, um, uh, no, you're, you're protecting, uh, Informants or whatever, and I didn't think there was anything there. It was an obvious informant. It didn't, to me, deal with foreign affairs that much. Um, I have talked to the chairman who has the ability to release it, Devin Nunez, the congressman from California. He's got to go through a waiting period uh, before he can release it. But I'd be very surprised if, in the next two weeks, the rest of the country can see it. I'm disappointed if you. Yeah, well, we were supposed to meet to what, 4.30 was that the official time? And I do want to get to this thing in Oshkosh. I don't want to be that late. So yeah, let's take one more question and then I'll maybe hang around here for just a little bit. Do we have any more? We have one more? Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, you have one more. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Michael Gerhardt. Oh, no, no. Michelle. Okay, sorry. I guess I'll, <laughs> I'll take a devil's advocate. How do you feel about the government? Um, because we have so many lines, you came to spend in there, we're no longer... This is the problem, being in Washington. And I'm going to give you a politician's answer that you don't like. Um, when I left Madison, I had been there for 21 years and was learning things every day, and I think it was as conservative and fresh when I left as the day I got there. And I think in whatever business you're a part of, you wouldn't walk in and say, I'm going to get rid of everybody who's been here more than 12 years because you get rid of a lot of experience. Uh, one of my colleagues to the south of here, Jim Sensenbrenner, has been here, I think, 35 years now. And I don't know if term would proposal he'd go, but it's kind of handy to have somebody around here who would say, this is why we did this in 1990, and we tried this in 2002, and it didn't work out. I think a big problem we have in Washington is a lot of the key positions are determined by seniority. I mentioned a second ago that um, the people negotiating the big appropriation bills are people on that committee. And quite frankly, the people that are negotiating are not there on merit or work ethic or ideology. They're there because they've been there a long time. And just like any business, you just can't keep promoting people and say, you're important because you hung around for 16 years or hung around for 26 years. That's a problem. And I think you have to, I think disproportionately those people have been there a long period of time is also part of the problem, particularly in the Senate. Um, I mean, although there's some people who just got there are a problem too, but the idea of promoting people to such a huge degree based on seniority is a problem. And in the Senate, you get some of these people, the committee chairmen are very powerful. And a bill can't move unless the committee chairman says it can move. You get a bad committee chair, they're there for six years. You know, uh, I mean, that's, to me, ridiculous. I and mean, you, you get this job like I have, and you say, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's do stuff. And you have a committee chairman of the Senate who's starting out and says, I'll be here for six years. That's ridiculous. What am I supposed to do, run for three more terms just so I wait the guy out and can get something through. Um, I, uh, I really, really disagree with the seniority system, which historically is worse than it is now. I remember reading about government when I was in high school, they had people who were committee chairs for, you know, 16 years in a row. But we need changes, and uh, I think the lack of urgency, a lot of that lack of urgency coming from people who have been around there forever, is part of the problem. There's no doubt about it. They are used to current things. And that's why I said the good thing about Trump is he wants to change things. And some of those people hanging in there for 20 years, they don't see the problem. I see the problems. Don't you see the problems? Oh, yeah. You see in so many ways the country worse off than it was 20 years ago. And these guys in Washington just don't get it. And they don't. I, I, my, my major frustration, though, is I don't like the policy of putting people in key positions in which they're negotiating the whole budget in which I do not think, I do not think they have those positions for any reason other than they hung around there a long time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
They move the ball in the right direction a little, but not quick enough. I mean, there was a, a, a major appointment, and because we are being taped, I don't want to get back to the guy who didn't get the committee chair, but in which Paul gave a major assignment to somebody who had, been, who had not been there as long. It was a good call, and uh, that was a good call. But overall, the norm is it would be considered rocking the boat not to give the senior guy the chairmanship, and that's a problem. It really is. And uh, he made one call, an important call, and again, I don't want people to find out who it is, but that I think was the wrong call. And people complained to him about it, and he hears about it, and uh, maybe eventually something will do. Maybe we'll do something because there's at least, as he knows, that one one of our most important positions right now is being held by somebody. Who... <laughs> Well, I, I'm, I've got to take off and go to Oshkosh, so I'll kind of hang around here for five minutes and say hi to folks. And, uh, and, and just one announcement, uh, I see a lot of you put your, your email address on these forms. If you would like to receive our e-update, I need you to actually check the box underneath your name. If you don't check the box, we cannot send you